Thank you for joining us once again on What Saith the Scripture. I'm Brant Stubblefield. And I'm Christian Franklin. And tonight we have question and answer segment, which is typical on our Lord's Day evening broadcast. Before we begin this evening, Christian, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you now. Father, uh, it is so good to be here on the broadcast. And Father, we just want to do you justice by looking into your word to answer these questions that we have received. Father, they're very insightful and very thought-provoking, and it challenges us to dig deeper into your word. Father, thank you again for this opportunity, and let us do everything to the glory and edification of you, Father. We pray all this in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Christian, kind of fill the viewers in. You know, several had been texting me concerned about you. What was it like having COVID-19? And just kind of tell us a little bit about that. I had COVID-19, no surprise there, oh, but uh, yeah, social distance, right? No, um, but no, it, it, you know, basically, you know, I, I think I'm going to say this right off the bat. You know, some people want to be skeptical and say, this is not a real It is thing. real. It's real. And I had it. You know, there's the symptoms, everything. But, you know, what really helped me get through, and this is going to sound kind of cliche, but I'm going to say this, was intense Bible study. Uh, you, know, con you know, talking with the brethren, you know, through communication, through phone, uh, very encouraging messages were sent to me. Obviously, the viewers, thank you all for the prayers. Uh, you know, it, it really it, it was, in, you know, it was edifying and encouraging to myself to know that, you know, not only were people looking out for me, you know, right. for my well-being, but even while I was at home watching the broadcast, we had men able to fill in for me and do a wonderful job. It all I mean, worked out in the end. Absolutely. And yeah. Your mother has had it. Mm -hmm. Your grandmother has had it. You know, COVID-19 hit my home early on. Remember my wife and all of our, right. you know, we've mm -hmm. had it. And I know we've had several others in the congregation here that in the past have had it. Mm -hmm. So the good news is, if there's good news, that several who have had it hopefully have built up now an immunity to right. it, right? Right. And so far, thankful to the grace of God that no one in our congregation you know, no one has passed away from it. That's right. Several have had it, but everyone has come through it. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. It's no conspiracy. The, the COVID-19 disease is real, mm -hmm. and it has affected a lot of people. Now, people may utilize it politically or other ways for an yeah. advantage, and we won't get into that tonight. But the disease itself is real, and many people um, have lost lives. In fact, one of our dear friends this last week, we learned, um, Brother Del Pope, he had passed away from COVID-19. So several people have passed away from it, and we want to keep all of their families in our prayers. We hope tonight that you, the viewers, are listening because we have several questions, Bible questions, that are worthy of a Bible answer. Christian, give us our first question tonight, and let's sure. dig into the Scripture. Well, we actually had a question come in, uh, basically asking, why do people, people accuse others of being Pharisees and not Sadducees? We, we hear that a lot. And the follow-up to that was, what specifically did they do that made Jesus upset? So, I mean... You know, that's a good question. Listen to this again. Why do people refer to some as Pharisees, but not Sadducees? That's right. Sometimes if, you know, someone, someone will think, well, that, that guy's strict, mm -hmm. right? And they'll say, oh, he, he's Pharisaical, or he's a Pharisee. But why don't they refer to them as a Sadducee? Well, I don't know the answer to that, actually, other than... The Pharisees, all of my life, have been those that have been regarded in the Bible, right, as the strictest sect of Judaism. Right. And so sometimes people will falsely accuse conservative brethren of being Pharisees just because they want to follow the Bible. That's right. But we do not want to be like the Pharisees that actually were condemned by God. In other words, the Pharisees were not condemned because they followed the Bible. God wants us to follow the Bible, mm -hmm. but the Pharisees were condemned for something, and we want to find out what that was and make sure that we stay completely away from that. That's right. Well, I mean, a couple of thoughts that came to my mind, first off, in Matthew 6, is, you know, Jesus is making the comparison of not trying to parade around charitable deeds, and that's what the Pharisees were known for. They wanted to parade around their good works. And, you know, we, obviously, as Christians, we are to, you know, maintain good works, Titus 3, 8. Yes. But again, we must do it in a humble fashion, James 4, 10, and not something that parades ourselves or right. exalts ourselves above others because we are doing something, you know, for the benefit of others. We're trying not to do that. Amen. So that, that was one thing that, you know, the Pharisees were known for. And, yeah, they were ostentatious, mm -hmm. right? And they wanted to present their religion almost as if it was a parade mm -hmm. and not an inner, true, dis disciplined religion 
And I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, it talked about they love to stand on the street corners to be heard by their long and pretentious prayers. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, go into your closets, right? right? And the Father who heareth you in secret shall reward you. Um, Christian, we actually mentioned this today in our That's true. Lord's Day meeting. Do you have Matthew 23? Sure, three? I'll flip over Do there. Do you mind reading that? To yeah. me, this is one of those passages, a lot of Bible passages about the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. But to me, this one, kind of like in summary form, gets right to the heart of the matter of what was wrong with the actual Pharisees. Sure. Matthew chapter 23, in verse 3, the Bible says, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So again, listen to the text, guys. As long as they were following, or excuse me, as long as they were teaching the Word of God, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, go ahead and do it, Jesus said, right? Mm -hmm. Because when that was spoken, that was under the old law. Go ahead and do what they teach because they teach accurately for the most part. Right. The problem was there was a disconnect between what they taught and what they practiced, mm -hmm. which is evidence of the last clause in that passage which says they say and they do not. Mm -hmm. And that's the definition of a hypocrite, an actor on a stage playing a part that he or she has no true moral compass in living. And so Christianity is not just something that we teach, it's something that we live. That's right. And if we teach one way and live another, the difference of that is hypocrisy and that is disdained in Scripture. That's right. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say, right? So Amen. we have to be very careful of that. In fact, Christian, we can flip over to Ezra 7.10. Listen mm. to what the Bible says. For Ezra had prepared in his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it mm -hmm. and to teach in Israel all the statutes and commandments. Isn't it interesting yeah. that Ezra, this great scribe and man of God, that the only way in which he actually taught the Word of God, that was after he had sought it, after he had prayerfully digested it, and he had put it in practice in his own life through obedience, then he taught others. That's right. The Pharisees were saying and doing not. That's right. Ezra was teaching it only after he lived it. Amen. Yeah, Matthew 15, 7 through 9, I love that you brought that up because, you know, that was also another problem. The Pharisees, that they were elevating man-made doctrine yes. above God, you know, the, the doctrine of Christ that Christ was teaching, but, you know, they tried to, you know, they tried to find a loophole in a way to try to incorporate right. man-made doctrine to be elevated above God, right? Acts 5, 29, you know, it's better to, we'd rather to obey God than man, but they were not doing that. So I love how you brought that up right, right there. Yeah, so. you know, the Bible says there, they worship me, right? Mm -hmm. and, but their heart is far from me. They worship me and honor me with their lips or their mouth, but their heart is far from me. Mm -hmm. And that's why the worship there is vain, which really means empty or useless. So all of these passages, there were times in which they taught what was wrong, Matthew 15. But there were also times where they taught what was correct, but they didn't practice it. And so I want to make this very clear tonight. Just because someone um, is living a very uh, conservative, disciplined life, and they're trying to follow God's word, it's not fair or honorable nor is it biblical to cast a stone at them, right? A false stone, by the way, saying, oh, they're a Pharisee. Because Jesus himself said what they were guilty of was ostentatious, pretentious behavior, making a show out of religion. They were guilty of saying one thing and doing another. That's hypocrisy. And they were guilty of a religion whose heart was disconnected. So if we point to someone and say, oh, they're just a Pharisee because we think that they're trying to obey God's law, mm. that's not what Phariseeism is. No. Phariseeism in the New Testament, right, according to Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus said, beware of the leaven mm -hmm. of the Pharisees. That's right. And there are three points right here that prove what this leaven is, and we want to stay away from that. We do not want ostentatious uh, behavior a public, uh, you know, like a parade. Mm -hmm. We don't want to say one thing and do another, That's hypocrisy, right. and we don't want our lips saying one thing and our heart disengaged. Amen. Uh, just because of the question mentioned this, can you explain the little differences between a Pharisee and a Sadducee and some of the differences? I was actually going to bring that up. Well, uh, great question, by the way. Well, Matthew 22 and verse, you know, 23, there is, you know, we see, uh, uh, you know, seeing into the Sadducee's mindset that's, the Bible says in Matthew 22, 23, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. And they even talk about that again in Acts 23 and verse 8, that they didn't even believe in angels or spirits. So say they, they was a, there was a denial of certain doctrines being taught and certain entities that even Jesus taught in Matthew 13 about the angels 
They didn't believe in any of that. You know, it's interesting, Christian. Yeah. There's always extreme thought in religion, mm -hmm. right? Right. It's just like today. <clears throat> Yet the Bible plainly, absolutely condemns the worshiping of angels. But we don't deny the existence of angels. Right. Right? Right. And so it's kind of the Sadducees. Well, you know, all of a sudden their religious doctrine that they held was that this spirit realm, the resurrection, angels, anything connected with that, they denied its existence. Mm -hmm. By the way, they were sad, you right. see. Mm -hmm. Anybody would be sad. Like that, Nemo? A little it's cheesy? Only, it's only but it's true. <laughs> Wouldn't anybody be sad who denied the resurrection? Because it would take away all the hope that we have. Any thoughts on that, Nemo? No? He's so. still grinning. <laughs> well, that just came to me, but I thought yeah. it was pretty good. No. Right. But, but all of these passages and more teach us that, that true Phariseeism, which people bemoan and decry, and rightfully so, that has to be understood with how the Bible outlines it. You, know, you and I do not get to redefine that and then throw it at somebody just because we think that they're following the Bible. That's right. So, fact, yeah. we have to follow the Bible. Absolutely. The Pharisees were not condemned for following the Bible. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John right. chapter 14, Thanks. verse 15. Amen. Right. Sorry, go ahead, finish it up. No, 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 you're good. I mean, that, that's right. You know, I love your lesson this morning because we really need to heed warnings. I mean, the Bible is not, it, it's so many things encompassed into one. It's warnings to what not to do. So again, right. we have so many Doc, so much doctrinal teaching on how not to be like the Pharisees. They were a wonderful example of what not to be. Yeah. So we need to take, you know, we always look for good examples in the Bible of what to be. Now we also need to be looking at what not to be, great too. Point. So, I the mean, kind of great. people yeah. not needed in the church of Christ. Amen. And the Pharisees would serve as a perfect outline of the kind of people we do not need. Why? Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because it spreads mm -hmm. and it's based upon one common thread, and that's hypocrisy that manifested itself in false uh, false religious activity, parading, ostentatious behavior, elevating their own opinions above God's word, and saying one thing and doing another. Amen. Absolutely. Another question tonight? Sure. We had a question, uh, really a comment. A uh, viewer asked, please help me understand Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. That's yours. So <laughs> I'll jump right into it. And again, if you want to chime in, you know. Uh, so I was studying this afternoon about this, and what's interesting, the verse says, I'll read the verse, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest a woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So again, we look at the context of Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, we're seeing that this is epistolary. This is, this is Jesus spiritually evaluating the church, the Thyatira, right? So what's interesting here is I circled Jezebel. Now, doesn't this sound familiar to an Old Testament narrative, Jezebel, oh, right? Oh, yes. This, this, it's interesting because once you compare the two, we have Jezebel here, a prophetess in the church at Thyatira. We also have Jezebel who was the wife of King Ahab, right? 2 Kings chapter 16, uh, 2 Kings 18, and then we see again in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 22, what was she known for? Uh, you know, she was known for uh, prostitution, witchcraft, right? So what's interesting here is when we see the text in Revelation 2.20 talking about this Jezebel, right? She's a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. What's interesting about uh, Jezebel in the Old Testament, she helped influence the worship of two gods, Baal and Asherah, for two, a male and a female fertility god that were the gods of the Canaanites and the Phoenicians. So this kind of, I, I kind of did some extra right. research on this, but I think it's really important to know the kind of the comparison of these two because Jezebel's teaching witchcraft and fornication and all, what's happening again, even within the church of the New Testament. So ultimately, all this stuff there's false in. teaching yeah. been brought into the church here. That's right. Yeah. And which has led to a plethora of problems, including sexual immorality and other things, mm -hmm. hence that word Jezebel being utilized there. Right, absolutely. So what, what does Jesus tell them? I mean, what, what are they supposed to do to counteract this problem. Well, here's the thing. I gave her space to, this is verse 21, to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So behold, in verse 22, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And in verse 23, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. That's interesting. Amen. Yeah. 
And you know, what's interesting too is when we think about, uh, I was kind of doing some research of the seven churches of Asia Minor. I, I love researching the Bible because it kind of gets you steamrolling and you know, there's no end to it. There's no end to it, right? So I look at verse 24, the Bible says, but unto you, in Revelation 2, verse 24, right, unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine in which have not known the depths of Satan, right, deep truths of Satan, as they speak, I will put on you none other a burden. So what's interesting here, we're seeing the depth of Satan, Thyatira. Pergamos was known as the throne of Satan, and then other churches were known as different compartments of Satanic, that they, they each had their own problems. They each had different things yeah. going on in the know, church. I think it was yeah. only two congregations that That's were right. not specifically chastised mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. But, but you're right, many of the congregations had large problems, mm -hmm. right? And however, none of those were insurmountable if they would immediately heed the warning of Jesus and repent. And they were all told in some way to repent. Repentance means change. Right. And we find ourselves infiltrated with false doctrine or sexual immorality, whatever the case would be in the local church. If we find ourselves under problems, small or large, the same teaching ultimately comes back to one word. That's repentance. Because without change, God is not going to tolerate open sin to continue in the ranks of a local congregation without, without it causing us great harm. That's right. Sin does not just get to reign. It doesn't get to reign in your physical body without a check and balance system and chastisement uh, or problems. It doesn't get to reign in the local congregation. And so that's one of the great things that we have to learn as the people of God, that God expects every congregation to repent when we are engaged corporately and have allowed things to come in that are not correct. That's right. Well, think about the depth of Satan. You know, think about something that's deep. Think about the ocean. It's so deep, it gets dark, and it's, things are hidden, right? Yes. So Satan, he's the father of all lies, John 8, 44. So lies can be hidden, and they can spring up. Well, I love this passage in 2 Corinthians 4, 3. You quote it so many times. But if our gospel be hid, it is hidden them that are lost. So think about darkness and light. We're seeing so many comparisons here of uh, illustrations being made, light and dark. And so when we see the depths of Satan, it's dark. It's, you know... They, they have become, you know, they don't have vision. They don't have any guidance because they've been so engulfed as fornication. And right. that specifically for that congregation. Congregations there, you know. take on identity, personality, mm -hmm. and, and basically their own trajectory because congregations are made of people. Right. And so if many people, or even a leadership, leadership or much, many of the people start cascading out of control into spiritual sin and allow things like this influence of this uh, Jezebel, if they allow this false doctrine and sexual immorality in, it does much more harm than we ever understand. And that's why it is Im absolutely imperative that we understand the need to repent. Therefore, every elder deacon and preacher at large on the program tonight watching is needed, every member as well, but Amen. especially our leadership is much needed to take arms up, not physical arms, but the spiritual sword, Ephesians 6 and 17, which is the word of God, and do work in the local congregations. Because sometimes, Christian, here's the truth. One of the reasons we're not converting through evangelistic endeavors as many people as we would like to, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, he that went his souls is wise, mm. is because oftentimes we don't have a living, healthy organism to convert them to. Mm. So, yes, they're converted to the universal body of Christ, which is living and healthy, but I'm talking about a local congregation. Ultimately, when somebody is brought in, right, the local body, that they're going to have to be able to see a steadiness and a consistency of a people that have truly been separated from the world living for God, not engulfed in the flames of liberalism, in the flames of immorality, in the flames of false doctrine, which ultimately, like a dark, deep pit and dungeon, like you said, no vision, no assistance, in a, in a place that, that we don't want to be. That's right. You know, and we're not trying to say that every congregation is without oh, no. flaw, but we want to make sure that we find a congregation that is, you know, we, what we do is we, we really edify each other. We bear one another's burdens, as you said, Galatians 6, 1. And we really, really, we try to strengthen each other, make sure we don't fall away, Jude 23. So uh, it, it's, really good you points know, you made. Yeah. It's one thing to be in a congregation even here. Hey, we're trying to follow the New Testament pattern as best as we can. Every once in a while, we have a hiccup. We're like people, right? Mm -hmm. And, and we, we make admis admission of it. We do better. We repent, and we move forward. But what we don't want to do is be in a place where we cannot say, you know what, we, we need to correct that. If we ever get to the place where our pride inhibits us and keeps us or prohibits us from doing the right thing, and we begin to think that, you know, there's nothing we need to correct. There's nothing we need to look forward to. 
And right. we're going to find ourselves, like one of the congregations there uh, in Asia, being chastised severely by Jesus if we're not careful. That's so right. good question tonight, and let us all do this as homework. Let us all review this week the seven churches of Asia and see which, after a careful and honest examination of our own congregation where we hold residence, let's see which one most emulates and patterns itself after where we reside. That's are we right. more like Ephesus or are we more like Philadelphia? Are we more like Thyatira, Pergamus, Sardis, Philadelphia? Which one are we like? Right. So, yeah, absolutely. One more thought I had, you know, talking about, how, especially within the Church of Christ, one of the sayings that we have is we try to model ourselves after the New Testament church. Yes. Now, sometimes modeling will also come on with the negatives, too. So we have yes. to be able to sure. find the positive yeah. and replicate while, that, too. But while you're on that, I want to hit some. I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a friend I grew up with here while back. He heard us say on this broadcast, you know, we want to be like the first century church. Mm. And he kind of, oh, it's little, really, it was smart. You know, he came back with a little bit of ridicule and said, which one do you want to be like, Corinth or Ephesus? <laughs> well, with all due respect, that's a very shallow and silly proposition to think that we cannot be like the model and the pattern that God wants us to be simply because of human failures in the past. One of the reasons I believe in the authenticity and inspiration of the text, it does not gloss over the mistakes of the finest people and or congregations of God's own people. God does expect us to do right. And by the way, when Paul chastised the church at Corinth the first time, he wrote back in the second epistle and they had made changes. That's right. So yes, mm -hmm. I don't mind being at the church at Corinth if you understand that the problems that they had, they were moving past them as they became educated and learned better. That's right. So don't pull that on us to say, well, you know, you can't go by the Bible and be the church of the first century because which church would you be like? And by the way, there were some of the seven churches of Asia that were praised by God that did not have any large mark against them. So yes, you can be faithful to God. And if you are in a congregation that has some faults, let's work past them and let's get back to the pattern and let's do good. And let's don't bring up silly propositions and thoughts trying to evade what the truth is by some man-made thought. I mean, we're not going to allow that on this program. Eh, denied. Amen. There you go. <laughs> uh, we had a third question here. Basically, this viewer is asking, is it wrong for a Christian to vote? Okay. You want to start on that one? <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. I think about Romans 13 with government. Because when we think about voting, when we think about the election coming up, obviously this is in light of the election is going to take place. Well, I think about Romans 13 that we are subject unto higher powers and we so... As law-abiding citizens, we have an obligation to abide by the law. Uh, we also have a say. We live in a time and an era that we do have a say in what our country, you know, really represents and what they stand for. And so we do, as the people, have a say in that. We are to respect authority and be praying for our leaders, right? First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And it's just interesting, you know, this person asking this question, it's not necessarily, you know, we're not trying to favor a certain candidate over another. This person is just basically asking, is it wrong for a Christian to vote? Basically, that would be saying, is it wrong for a Christian to be involved in political affairs? You know, along right. that line. So we want to make sure that we uh, obviously look to the Scripture to the best of our sure. ability to answer this question, obviously. So, I Amen. Mean, yeah. and, and I think you've answered it effectively. Mm -hmm. We have scriptural example, binding example, where it is not wrong to have earthly citizenship. Mm -hmm. You know, some people who believe it's wrong to vote, they will say, well, you know, our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians chapter, from whence we wait for our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's true. Our eternal and most permanent citizenship is in heaven. But that does not divorce us from the fact that we also have earthly citizenship. And in fact, the Pauline epistle mm -hmm. in Romans, the 13th chapter says that we are, right, to be subject, verses 1 through 5, if you read that entire a uh, series of passages, we're to be subject to the higher powers. And if anyone resisted those powers, he resisted God because God is the one that fundamentally designed civil government. Amen. So civil government is not evil. And I think a lot of people, especially in America, you have some people that are what I call in the compartment Christian of anti-government. Mm, okay. It's because they have a spirit of defiance within them. They're anti-everything. You know, they're just yeah. against authority. Well, you have to realize that God is a God of authority. Jesus said, all authority has been granted to me, Matthew 20 and 18. Some people don't serve Jesus because they don't want an authority over their life. Why call you me 
Right, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Jesus is Lord. He's master. Mm -hmm. He has authority. Some people don't like the model traditional home. Here's why they don't like it. Because God said in the home as the main figure of authority, whom? The father. The father or the husband, mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 25, yeah. uh, 23 through 25. Mm -hmm. The mother is the secondary authority over the children, right? But some people don't like that model home because they resist. You know, they don't want to be told that we need a father and a mother and children. Mm -hmm. That they want to divorce themselves from any traditional as they see it. And it's not traditional. It's really biblical is the better right. word. Mm -hmm. Unless you're using the word traditional like 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which means ordinance of God. They want to divorce themselves from any traditional element of authority that's based upon biblical principles. That's right. So they push away from civil government. They push away from the, the home, as God would have it. And they push away from the church. And I think there's a streak of defiance in people that almost like a rebelliousness is like a teenager that never got past those years of resistance. And so here's a 40, 50-year-old man, and he's like a teenager, and it's like I'm throwing a temper tantrum because nobody's going to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Paul says in Romans 13, 1, if you are a Christian, you are to submit to the higher powers that be. And someone's watching the saying, yeah, but what about Acts 5, 29? We're not to that yet. This is the general rule. Right. Christians are to submit to the civil government in which they live. They're to pay their taxes. They're to give honor and tribute to, to the king. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, honor the king. That's right. They're to pray for those in high authority. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 and 2. But also, Christian, there's the other extreme. Some people find themselves so religiously devout that they seemingly fear any type of any type of uh, co-mingling with the government. Right. It's almost like a holier than thou. I'm not going to vote because I'm a member of another kingdom. Mm. Well, actually, you're a member of whatever state you live in. You are an earthly citizen, and you are a member of the heavenly kingdom. We always realize that heavenly kingdom citizenship takes precedent over the lower one. Absolutely. That's why Acts 5.29 is, it's better to obey God rather than man. Right. But we don't quote this verse to dismantle the basic teaching of how we should live in America or any other country we live in. That's right. So here is Paul, Acts the 25th chapter, and he calls upon his Roman citizenship, right? He calls upon that. So there's nothing wrong with utilizing your citizenship to further the gospel, to advance the value system of Christianity, and one way in which you can do that in today's world is by casting a vote of which the government that we're a member of, authorized by God, civil government, allows us to have a part and a peace. But if we decide to vote, we must vote by faith, Romans 14, 23. Explain that, Christian. They talk about, you know, whatever is not of faith is of sin. So, I mean, it's just, it's blatant right there, right? So we must be voting, you know, according to the faith. And bringing up faith, I don't mean to interrupt you no, here, you but know, I was thinking about right. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, you know, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, contend for the faith, Jude 3. So if we're going to be contending for the faith, trying to get the right. gospel message out, Aren't we, don't we have a, an obligation or a responsibility to try to put those in office who yes. may not be exactly a New Testament example but are going to help further, help us yes. still evangelize and do yeah. our job? I mean, we're, we're not we're voting for a gospel preacher. No. But we are voting for, here's how I tell people. I won't tell you who I'm voting for on this program because uh, that's not the design of this right. broadcast, but I'll tell you how I vote. When I vote, I realize that there are two value systems that two opposing candidates or parties put forth. I take those main points of value and I see which of those most closely aligns with the New Testament scripture. Protection of life, religious freedom, right? right. You know, I look at those particular points and then I weigh that out with discernment and a prayerful disposition and vote accordingly to the one that I truly believe based in faith, Romans 14, 23, is going to most closely align with scripture. But may a Christian vote? Absolutely. A Christian not only may vote, the actuality is he needs to vote and do his part the best he can mm -hmm. in helping his earthly citizenship and his earthly government to be held as close as possible to the rise of the New Testament. Amen. Another question tonight, Christian? Oh, Demo, did you have something real oh, fast? Sorry, come on. I just wanted to add on, in some cases, that same sort of thought, we should understand that that's the same permission that gives us the right to run for government in, in order to change our communities for Christ 
in order to run for office, you know, just putting ourselves in a position of authority so that we can understand that we are still a part of this earth. There are some things that we just may have to say, you know what, these candidates are there, they're not doing what we need them to, regardless if it's religious or not. Sometimes it may just be even basic fiscal law that, hey, this isn't a biblical way, or they're not responsible with the money, they're not handling these laws correctly. Maybe I should run for office and we can implement these sort of things, not to like put a religious clamp on the government, but to actually help things be run more peacefully, more correctly. And the Old Testament especially has a lot of good practical ways that if implemented correctly, can benefit any government. I'm glad you mentioned that. The first way and the most exclusive way, the permanent way of changing the world is one person at a time through gospel preaching. Amen. Right? That, that's the primary. Mm. That is the primary way that God wants us to change the world through a resurrected Savior and through the teaching of the whole counsel of God. But Nemo's right. We have influence, Christian. And every Christian ought to utilize their influence to the goodness of God. I'm mean, assuming to the furtherance of God's goodness. Mm. All right, so let's give some examples. Let's look at very local. What about running for school board in your community? And if you were able to get on school board, could you not help make some decisions that would help countless children, right, through the evaluation of, of curriculum and, and through the decision of who's going to be hired and through the events at school? That's one way. But now remember, if you can't vote and you can't be engaged in politics, you couldn't be on school board because that is a lower form of politics, very localized. Mm. But I believe the New Testament teaches that you can. What about at work? Maybe you want to become the supervisor so that you can help set some policies that are closer oriented to Scripture. Maybe you want to be the coach for the Little League where your son plays. Why? Because you can make sure you don't practice on Wednesday nights. So these are just a few examples of Christians can use their influence in a positive way. Mm -hmm. This is the main way, gospel teaching. But then we can also utilize our example, Christian, to help closer to the New Testament teaching. That's right. You know, and think about the first century. You know, we're learning in class that there were many politicians that were members of the church. They had influence. Yes. They had pull. So they were able to, you know, help the gospel message be spread in a community that, that hated Christians. I was just thinking, you know, at the end of Philippians, uh, you know, the, the, the greeting, you know, uh, Paul writes, salute every saint in Christ Jesus, verse 21 in Philippians 4. The brethren which are with me greet you in verse 22. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are Caesar's household. So it's interesting that, you know, Christians right. did have a, a pull. They did have yes. an influence on government well, affairs. I mean, even yeah. Paul, he's preaching before King Agrippa. Yeah. Felix, the governor. I mean, in other words, Paul was a man that was not just teaching the common man. He really had access to many of the social elites and political uh, favorites, uh, favorites of his, the day and age. That's right. Now, he did not compromise his position because he spoke to those people who were elites, right. but he was able to at least teach them. I mean, think about it. God opened the door up so that he could actually speak to King Agrippa. Wow, right? And Agrippa said he was almost persuaded, which right. meant that maybe later on that Agrippa was able, even though he never may have become a Christian, we don't, you know, we, we, have, right, we, we don't have record. We have to just assume it stopped right there. But he doesn't have any hostility towards Paul that we know of. So that might have opened Providence the door for Paul to be able to do things because he was favored by Agrippa. That's right. So you're right. Nemo, do you have anyway, something? Sorry. And again, going back to the Old Testament example, many God allowed the Israelites to have a king, and many of those kings followed him. And in that same line of thought that even here today in America or wherever that you may live, if we do get into a position of power, we also have to remember we are following God first. But then we still have a responsibility to those that we are serving, Amen. whatever level, local, federal, anywhere in between, to follow Christ and then use that as an example to how you lead others in whatever capacity that we are in. Amen. And even though God eventually allowed Israel to have a king, of course, he didn't want them to have a king, right? right. And he did tell them, see, civil government and an earthly king comes with a price. Remember what God told Samuel? All right, you tell the people. First of all, if they absolutely demand one, you tell them that, you know, he says, Samuel, you haven't failed. The people, the people are the ones that, that have cried about it so much, I'm going to give it to them, right? They've rejected me, not you, Samuel. But then God told Samuel to tell the people, all right, if you want a king, you're going to have to give up some of your property, eminent domain. You're going to have to send some of your young men to war. 
Mm. There's going to be tribute and taxes that are paid. So isn't that the same in today's world? Since we have earthly civil government, we do have eminent domain. Yeah. We do have the taxation. We do have uh, systems of authority in place. We do have wars in which men and young ladies now are sent off. That's a whole other story I'll get into one of these days, but mm. don't get me on that soapbox. <laughs> but, but that are sent off to fight and ultimately die for our freedom. Yeah. So civil government comes the price to us as a people. So there's nothing wrong with, as a citizen of America, then utilizing your influence to do whatever you can to promote things and policies that are more in line with New Testament truth. That's right. And, and we want to make that very clear tonight. And so, and not just in politics, again, on the ball field, mm -hmm. at work, anywhere you can influence people, why not? Let's be light, let's be salt. Amen. Matthew 5, 13. So we have another question. I'll look, just reading this real fast. Sent in to us. Um, basically, this viewer is asking, was Melchizedek the pre-incarnate of Jesus Christ? No. Now, we will look at Hebrews. My Bible's kind of falling apart here this evening. Hebrews, the seventh chapter. Mm -hmm. Read down about, uh, we'll just read verses one through three. Sure. In Hebrews chapter seven, starting in verse one, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first by being interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, without neither having beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. He's not Jesus pre-incarnate, no. but he is likened unto the Son of God. And I can see where just, an, just a casual reading of that, might, someone might gather that because I had someone in Bible class years ago argue vehemently with me. Mm. And they were, I mean, a good Bible student too. When it says having neither mother nor father, they really believed that Melchizedek did not have an earthly father or mother. But really what that means with, you study about priesthood and chronological descent, what mm -hmm. it means is there was no record chronologically of his ancestry. That's what that means. That's right. So now in what sense would that make him likened unto the Son of God? Well, what it means is since there was no record of his beginning, that particular point makes him likened to the Son of God who ultimately in a more magnified way Mm -hmm. Hath not beginning or end, because Jesus is what? Eternal. That's right. Colossians it, chapter 1, yeah. That's really what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. But Melchizedek is not actually Jesus. In fact, Melchizedek, Melchizedek, remember, received tithes from Abraham, that's right. which means Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. And it also, Melchizedek was a historical, real figure of the Old Testament who lived and died, but was likened unto, in some senses, the Son of God. But he is not Jesus pre-incarnate. Yeah, and I mean, it would also have to, you, the perfection factor too, right? You yes. Know, I mean, John, John 1, 29, Jesus is the, the lamb who takes away all the sins of the world because he's perfect. He is, he is here to take away our sin because he is, right. you know, not sin, but we all have flaws at some point. So, yes. Uh, so, I mean, there, there's some logic there, but that's a great answer. Um, so hopefully we answered that. I mean, this is one of those, you, this but, is one of yeah. those answers we could spend an hour on sure. and go through all about Melchizedek. But this, to me, is the heart and soul and the summary fashion of an answer that should be sufficient. And if not, if you'll message us privately, then someone here will get with you and study that more sure. in depth to answer that question. Absolutely. I guess we'll go on to the next one here. Uh, this was an interesting question. Okay. And this is actually something that I've kind of been thinking about, too. Okay, what is uh, it? Basically, this viewer was asking, are watching movies when I put it this in quotes, magic in them, is that wrong? And she gave specific examples such as Harry Potter or maybe some family Halloween movies okay. that play on TV, uh, Cinderella, we talked about that before. So she used some specific examples, but you know that's actually a question and that's actually a topic even within the church that most wonder about. Like, you know, mm -hmm. because we, we, we basically know in the Old Testament, you know, witchcraft, sorcery, even in the New Testament, it carries over those things are condemned. But, you know, are watching movies with that stuff, and even if it's, you know, quote-unquote family-friendly, is that wrong in itself? So I think that's a... Uh, I wish I had the pastor off the top of my uh, head here. Galatians, Galatians 5, 5, 19? Yeah, yeah, there it is. I got you. Yeah. 
Galatians 5.19, absolutely, across the board, condemns witchcraft and sorcery. Period. I mean, there, that's not debatable. That's like saying it's fornication condemned. Well, yes, it's condemned. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> what I would argue is, is that any movie, let, let, let's, let's take back for just a moment. Any movie, any social media, any music, anything secularly, okay, anything, anything from a secular point is not necessary but is optional. And I'm talking about the good stuff. Right. The bad stuff is evil, leave it alone. Mm -hmm. But in other words, if I, never, if I never heard secular music all of my life, I would really not be deprived in the sense of I, I, I couldn't make it to heaven. Okay, so this is not something we have to have. This is something that we are permitted to have if it is wholesome, clean, and honorable. So I would say there's a checklist, and I don't mean some rigid legalistic checklist. I mean here are some advisory points of Scripture, guidelines, if you will, heavenly spiritual guidelines that we should look at before we watch anything. Sure. So let's, let's back off of the witchcraft for just a moment. I'm, I mean this would include Andy Griffith. Y'all remember when he lit that cigarette up? Remember when he lit that cigarette up? As much as I like Andy Griffith, when he lit that cigarette up, that wasn't right. There's a couple of times in those episodes through the whole years that an expression was utilized that was not correct either. Now, that doesn't mean that all of that's wrong, but I'm just trying to be fair here. We don't want to say that, you know, all Harry Potter's wrong and all Andy Griffith's okay because that makes us become kind of like we're spoon-feeding people. I right. want to answer it in such a way that's biblical, and that puts the, the discipline that's needed and the filtration, which every father and mother, they're the filter of their homes, mm -hmm. back upon the home. Right. But here's the principles. According to Philippians 4, can you read that chapter and watch whatever it is you're watching? Whatever it is. If it's Cinderella, if it's Snow White, if it is uh, Dukes of Hazard, if it is uh, whatever it is... Can you read Philippians 4 and truly say it is good, honorable, of a good report, wholesome, etc.? Now, there have been times, I'm going to be frank and very candid, there have been times that I've watched things afterwards, I thought, you know what, I really shouldn't have watched that. It wasn't horrible, because I don't watch things like that, right. period. But there's been a few times I've watched things that I felt guilty afterwards because it had just enough within it that it, it made me think, you know what, that really wasn't proper as a Christian. You ever had that happen? Oh, absolutely. Of course, I prayed, yeah. and I believe mm. forgiven and move on. Sure. So I'm not saying that all movies are bad. I love movies. I like to watch things occasionally, sure. or westerns, things like that. Yeah. But I just want to be fair and don't, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, all rap's bad and all country's good. No, there's some country music that's filthy. Yep. So Philippians 4, first of all, is it good, honorable, etc.? Does it help me to seek the kingdom of God first? Can I participate in this by faith without right. sinning? And I could go on and on and on with these verses. Personally, Christian, I don't believe that merely watching something that's fictional is in and of itself wrong, as long as you understand it's fictional. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. Absolutely. Well, we did a broadcast here a while back talking about uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. You know, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and faith unfeigned, you know, faith without hypocrisy. So right. think about this. If what we're putting or what we're watching, right, may not be entirely, let's just say not entirely profane, but something that I, did, I have noticed with myself, you know, everybody has to be careful. We even, do. Even though strong, strong Christians have yes. to be careful because we can, we can say, oh, I've, had, I've heard this many times. I know Nemo has. We, you know, as long as we're not, you know, as long as this program does not have all, you know, it's not an hour worth of profanity. It's only got about a few minutes worth. It's yeah. okay. I can handle that. And that's See, dangerous. that's what happens. And so we start snowballing and snowballing. And I've seen people, basically my age, because that's who I associate with the most, really fall away from really biblical doctrine and get onto all these things just because they dabbled in it a little bit. When I was younger, I was guilty it. of some of that, but mm -hmm. I honestly have tried to make an overt effort to be very cautious about the movies that I allow my children to watch or what I go to watch, right. okay? And there have been times that I have gotten up out of a movie theater and took off mm -hmm. and left my money with them and just, just left because it's not, you're right, overall it was what society would call clean. Sure. 
But here's the truth, Christian. If we're sitting in there, remember Matthew 23, 3 with the Pharisees. If we say one thing and do another, that's hypocrisy. So if we're sitting there and, you know, every five, ten minutes, boom, here comes the word that's inappropriate. Yeah. And, and we have, you know, children with us and, and examples of who's there. Who's that guy? Oh, he's the preacher down at the Church of Christ. See, yeah. Well, it, it starts, you know, it, we have to start asking ourselves that question. And then, what is it doing on our own hearts? So I want to make the question broader than it was originally asked, you know, just because somebody waves a magic wand on TV, mm-hmm. I'm saying that by itself because I don't believe uh, in, quote, magic like that. I don't believe in, in those things today. No. But if that does bother somebody and that puts their mind on things of witchcraft and that mm-hmm. nature, it would be wrong for them. Romans 14, 23, yeah. if you can't do it by faith, it's a sin. So that part to me is fictional, and I can watch that, and that doesn't even in the least bit bother me. What truly bothers me and what I want to talk more about this evening is profanity in movies and sexual induendos Mm -hmm. and immodesty and things like that and the using of God's name in vain, which is becoming very common in our day and age, even amongst members of the church, flippantly using and irreverently utilizing the name of God, invoking his name on social media and everywhere else. That's right. Yeah, or think about euphemisms as we talked about before. The speech that we hear on TV, even though it's considered clean, has really started to impact the church. And so we become more loose with our communication and what we say. And so you hit it right on the head. And so, so is witchcraft wrong? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, and so if someone is, is at home playing some Ouija board or something like that, and that they believe that they're into that dark world and they're calling upon some seance or whatever you want to call that junk, that's absolutely a sin. Right. But if someone's watching, you know, Cinderella and, and she waves a magic wand. To me, that's simply fictional. Right. Um, however, if, if that bothers somebody, stay away from it. Here's mm-hmm. one thing I've learned uh, as I get older. None of that stuff is necessary for me going to heaven. Sure. But one thing that is necessary for me going to heaven is a pure heart to serve God with. And if I have to get rid of some of that junk along the way to get closer to God, so be it, I can live without it. That's right. But one thing I do know, profanity is always wrong. Um, things that cause my heart to lust or put me in a realm outside of the spiritual order of thinking... Those things are wrong. Nemo, do you have a comment? Yeah, and I think Christian can attest to it that the hardest of things sometimes is just saying, oh, I don't need to watch this movie because it's just not necessary. Especially for me wanting to be a filmmaker when it comes to certain films that's like, okay, is there a way that I can just filter that out completely or is that even worth trying to do? Like if there's a movie and, oh, there's a clean version, like, especially with music. If this is a clean, oh, this non-explicit, okay, that might be okay to listen to. But then you read the lyrics, and it's like, oh, just because they mute out certain words, the entire context is still there. The rest of the album isn't very clean at all. It's not uplifting. It matches none of those verses you put on the board. So even if it's clean in that regard, it's not clean from a biblical standard. And that's something that we can do away with. And that's becoming a lot harder and harder because there's so much more of it out there. And I understand that the younger children who may listen to music, who may see movies and don't understand the context and may not even know why that this is wrong in the first place, us older people have to set a good example for them and make sure that they understand. Because there are a lot of things that are meant for adults that don't have to be inappropriate. But at that same time, those type of things will be inappropriate for those that are younger. So we don't need to be watching those movies, even if they are biblically fine. If that context, like, for instance, certain parts of the Bible, young children don't need to hear that in the context of, okay, they're not going to be able to to maturely handle that information and Mm -hmm. utilize that appropriately. And even then, we had to be on guard with who's teaching our children certain things. Because there are some times where they may teach a biblical concept in an inappropriate manner. Amen. And, and sometimes it never hurts to be willing to go the extra mile. Let me give you an example. I was in Tennessee years ago holding a gospel meeting, way out in the middle of nowhere. So I go into town uh, to meet some people that had come from a, another town nearby for lunch. Mm-hmm. And we're at this place, and we're in there eating. Of course, I didn't know it, but all of a sudden, I see at the corner of my eye, basically somebody is uh, you know, drinking alcohol. Well, of course, it wasn't a bar, but immediately, that family said, look, we make it a policy in our home. We never eat in a restaurant, any cafe, or any home where liquor is present. Well, I wasn't about to, even though it wasn't a bar, and it was an isolated person over in the corner, and I had no idea they served out. You know, it just, you just went in to eat. I wasn't about to try to talk them out of that. 
the thing I should have done at that occasion, just what we did, is we said, hey, didn't know that, let's get up and let's go somewhere else to eat. And so what I'm saying is, um, especially in this kind of world that we live in today, we need to make sure, especially for our children, that if anything, we go the extra mile. Yeah. And so just some of the thoughts tonight. But you know, here are some scriptures of guidelines. And Christian, ultimately, every father there out there watching this evening or every mother, but really the father first, mother second, we're going to have to decide and have some tough conversations of what we let in our home. That's right. You know, one thing I was going to just capitalize on what Nemo said, there's a thing going around called clean version. Clean version, clean version. So that automatically puts in the minds of people does anybody, right? Secular Dirty. world telling us, right? Oh, well, it's clean, even though it has no cuss words. But see, here's something I have. Right. So, some people are going to get mad. Some people that know me, they're going to get mad at me for saying this. When I, when I look at the actual implication of a clean song or even a, a movie that's been edited, there are still things in it that do not match up with this. So yeah. that's, that's Satan being the father of all lies, deceiving, the world's deceiving. Right? It's like a half-truth. Yeah, and it's, it's a like, question of, yeah. as a Christian, and not listen, some of these things, I'll be honest with you all out there, mm -hmm. I'm still struggling with my own life. Sure. You know, for example, we, I go to Walmart. Some Walmarts sell liquor. Well, I do go to Walmart and buy things. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to go into a store that's predominantly liquor because I feel as though that I'm lending my dollars to that. Right. I'm not telling you exactly how to handle it in your life. I'm just telling you, my family, ourselves, has prayed and studied about these things because I conscientiously do not want to financially support anything that's of the dark realm, right? Right. Absolutely. But at the same time, we have to live in this world and with common sense, and it is difficult at times to make that distinguishing line of demarcation. Mm -hmm. So I'm patient with other people, but I think all of us would agree that you know there are some lines that have to be drawn and every father and mother better be at home really thinking about these things because every generation, I can tell you this, from my own experience, every generation gets a little bit softer in what they permit. My grandparents would have never occasioned a place ever that sold alcohol, period. Period. But here we are in 2020, and we kind of rationalize it like, well, you know, yes, we don't go to a bar. You know, we don't go down to the, quote, the liquor store. But we've almost accepted the fact that almost every place sells liquor. And their argument is they can't be in business unless they sell liquor. And we kind of think, well, you know, it's not their main thing, so we can go. And, and I'm not saying that's wrong. All I'm trying to say is mm -hmm. we're all having to ask these tough questions. And I suppose it's one way for us to study harder and look at our own lives. Right. But I also know that we've lost people in the congregations over the years because of the world. So don't ever underestimate the power of Satan. Don't ever underestimate his power. Amen. Christian, we always try to close. Uh, before we end oh, this, go ahead, think, yeah. one last question I wanted to get to, I think it's in similar vein as this previous one. We got this during the broadcast. It's from Kari. She asked, I was wondering if the use of medical marijuana is okay for municipal persons purposes in a state where it's legal. And she goes on to detail that it was from a suggestion from her psychiatrist that I would be giving it in low amounts. And she said it could be beneficial for me. And I would just like to know if it's okay. And she would be using a edible version with low traces of THC so that high would not be sustaining or prevalent. And she has no desire to smoke or anything, but she legitimately is wanting to know for medicinal purposes if that's something that would be okay or not. Here's what I would like to do with that question. I have not, probably call me naive, I have not researched that as much as I should have. Now, I want to say this, though. I believe that there is a leftist push in our country to legalize a lot of things, prostitution, uh, marijuana, and so forth. If we were truly talking about a medicinal point, that's one thing. Mm -hmm someone's end of life, cancer, that it's proven that it would subside. Right. But I am very fearful of giving authority to something from, and someone taking what I say and running with it because so many people are misusing, and I'm not saying the patient, I'm talking about the people that assign it are not truly, in my books, qualified, and it's more of a political thing, and they're passing this stuff out, and people are becoming hooked through the gateway drug of marijuana, and so I personally would like to have a week to really thoughtfully consider this and pray over it and get a better explanation. But I want to say at least hesitate, at least hesitate. Sure. You know, and I actually know many individuals and probably many of y'all do who have 
come towards the end of their life, been suffering with cancer, and they have been medically prescribed something along and that line. And that's one thing. That's one thing. Because it'd be no difference than morphine. Right, right. I mean, right. it's taking the edge off. Mm -hmm. But now when you're talking about something else from, from a, let's say, a mind, yeah. uh, an issue of the mind, I don't mean to put somebody down. I'm just saying that something that's treating an, a, a mental issue maybe, let's say, okay? Mm -hmm. That's going. That's not going to be uh, three or four weeks before you pass away. That's going to be a lifetime thing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's going to alter a person in some ways. Right. So I need to do some study on that and some deeper research before I commit to an answer on that. But I would say for now, absolutely hit the brakes and throw the car in park. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I would address. I'm very appreciative this person would ask this question. Because I do definitely believe that when it comes to medicines, not even just marijuana or THC, but a wide range of assortments of medicines have been abused and overdone. Even painkillers yeah. that are yeah, prescribed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the whole notion about it being legal and also plays again into the political factor of, oh, now that it's legal, I can prescribe it without knowing, oh, these people may have a business on the side. They may yes. know people that own it. So I... I would caution in that area as well, especially with it's a fairly new thing that just now being legalized, even though people have used it for years. The way that it's been used, the purpose that it's being used has a lot of red flags that we should A lot of things to consider here, Nemo. And so I hope the person doesn't think we're sidestepping, no. but I feel like that's a question that we really need to prayerfully consider sure. yeah. and study more about, not only from the Bible, but I need to research some things of what's going on before I commit to an answer here. Sure. We want to make sure on this broadcast too. You know what say at the scripture, not you know don't take what we say just on our own account yes. and go yes. like, like personal advice. Don't do that. We want to make sure we prayerfully study the material. So the Bible teaches whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. So mm -hmm. until we can have a thus saith the Lord, until we can know for sure that it rests within His scope of authority, mm -hmm. we want to stay away from it. Because the last thing we want to do is go beyond what is written and go down a path that would lead ourselves or those that we love to an eternal place of hell. We want to make sure that we're right with God, and being right with God means that we, that we methodically check things out and that we proceed with caution, because a lot of our pitfalls are really when we speedily race into something. The right. Bible teaches in Proverbs that one of the signs of a wise man is that he's not hastily towards things. Mm -hmm. So we hope and pray that will benefit you tonight, and we'll further study that this next week. Sure. Good question, and thank you for the question. As we close, Christian, we want to emphasize to everyone that Jesus is living in his church. Amen. We serve a living God, and a living God in a living church means that people are able to still be saved because his fountain and his blood are still flowing. Who can be saved? Any man or woman that truly believes that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8 and 12, that understands not only Jesus but the kingdom of God. That's right. What else, Christian? You know, we were talking about how we don't want to go from our accounts. But when it comes to salvation, the Bible's very clear, Amen. right? Mark 16, 16, the Bible says, this is Jesus speaking, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we know that those who believe and, the conjunction, and are baptized shall be saved. You have to trust Him. Mm -hmm. You have to obey Him. That's right. Believing. Repent of your sins. Confess with, his, with your mouth he's the Son of God. And like Christian said, according to Mark 16, Jesus himself said, That's right. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. Do you believe and have you been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? Christian, we hope and pray someone tonight wants to study the Bible and become a Christian. Mm -hmm. But we want everybody all around the world, starting right here in Edmond and going all across the world, we want everybody to be asking a particular question tonight. What is it? I think about Romans 4, 3, it says, What saith the Scripture? 